All right, so we're at the end of this week. We are halfway done with this class. There's a lot of material. So one of the things I, I put together really quickly and found some resources is I want to just go over really quickly that project managers, kind of that roles and responsibilities. And I, and I found this up at PMI.org, and I grabbed it, and I said, let's just use some of this and take a look and kind of see if everybody's on the same page about what a project manager is. That should help you on your project because then you'll have a little better idea then of what kind of things that project manager would do in the charter or what that charter is going to look like. So I put this in week four. We're on week four. Halfway done. And I love you, computer. Let me hit the enable editing so I can actually advance the slide. Yay, there we go. So part of that, and when you look at that scope and that charter, is planning that. So measurable goals. So think about this. How many of you have said, man, I'm going to get a lot more fit this year at, at, at January for my New Year's resolution? How many did that last year? But is that different than saying, I am going to lose 4.2 pounds, and I'm going to increase my quarter mile sprint time by 10 seconds or something like that. Does that make sense? So we, we want to set measurable goals. And we want to make sure that when we write that plan, they're measurable because we understand or we think we know what we're doing, but it may be harder for somebody else. And we want to, especially if we outsource that, that we have those measurable ideas. Measurable ideas. So that's kind of the big takeaway in all those. When you're planning this, any question, you want to understand what the business needs are. So, activity planning and sequencing. So, you do need to get people together for this. The reality is, even as the most skilled project manager and you have every piece of knowledge you think you're going to know, you don't know everything. But that activity planning is one where we can pull all these people together and say, we have these activities, what kind of constraints do we have? What kind of precedence do we have? So what needs to happen before another activity? Sometimes it's pretty obvious. We have to pour the concrete before we can level the concrete, right, and smooth it out. Sometimes it's not as obvious as that, especially when we're doing things like software design. Sometimes we end up with these weird loops and, and sequences. So you're going to do that activity planning, trying to figure out what's going on. You're going to construct that project structure. And again, that generally shows up in that charter of what kind of things are in that project. Who's involved? How are they involved? What are the major risks you see? Now, we have a whole section about just risk management. And in fact, we now have a class on just on risk management. But you should be able to identify some of the big ones. So if we're doing an outside construction project, and now I look at what's going on on the East Coast, what's a big issue for an outside plant? What's, gonna, what's happening in the East Coast right now? So does weather, is that one of those things that could certainly affect our, our project? Yeah. So, And then that leads to that comprehensive plan. resource planning and then we said resource planning and it became pretty evident that our biggest resource really is that idea of people so it really makes sense to put resources all together and people are a resource so what other resources do we have where are we going to get those resources and we're going to look at some of those problems and issues that we're going to have with that so we need to make sure that those resources are available we need to be able to figure out if we can pull resources from other parts of our corporation, whether we can lease resources. Maybe we use contingent employees. What's a contingent employee? Have you heard that term before? Maybe some of you have been this. 
So a contingent employee is one of the new terms we spin out in place of saying temporary employee. So if you go down to one of these temporary agencies like Manpower, you are a contingent worker. We don't have to pay you unless we need your services, right? We're not paying for a, your salary for a full year. We say, hey, I need a CPA for six months. Let's hire one out of Manpower. So that's one of the changes we've had. And more and more companies are looking at those contingent resources as a way they can accomplish something. Manpower and these temp agencies are quite frankly one of the largest employers in the United States. So we have Walmart, we have the governments if you want to add them all together, and we have temporary agencies. So it is a little different and the world is a little different. So we also are going to look at that capital spending and we're going to put it more in depth. We start looking at time. So in that project charter, you're going to have those time estimates. So some way, some way that we can create a timeline for this project. The best way seems to be to break it down into those small enough tasks, that work breakdown structure that we can create activities that we know how long they take. And then we can build it back up and figure out our entire timeline of what's going to happen. But again, that's where we can use those, those guesstimates of time so we know what's happened historically and we can use things like that optimistic, pessimistic, and most realistic formulas. We had two of them. The, the triangle or just dividing it by three, we add them all, divide by three, or we call it the beta distribution. And again, we use those a lot with time and, and money to try to figure out what's going on in the world. So one of the best tools that's come out, and I wish we had a long enough class that we could drive you into project management software in depth. And I have tried that before in the past, and the reality is we overwhelm you pretty quickly. So there are tools like Microsoft Project and, and others that give you the ability to create really elaborate scenarios about your time and your structure. And they work really, really well. But like any structure like this, they really are, there's a statement that's called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put in the right details at the beginning and your project charter's not done right, it really doesn't help you. It's just you're just piling crap on top of crap, quite frankly. So all that has to be done, and you can use software to do it, but again, you have to have that, that knowledge that what you're doing is actually what you're wanting to do. So scheduling, now we're going to, we're, once again, now we've got the time estimates, we've got our budget, and then we start looking at scheduling. And so that scheduling, there's a lot of different pieces to scheduling. We may need to take into a pack vendors and their ability to deliver the products. So think about a construction project like working on this building here. And there may be specialized parts that are needed. Maybe they need to replace the marble slab. There will be a lead time before we can actually get those. And so that scheduling can get very, very complicated. And when we're doing the scheduling, that's where that software really comes in to save our butt. Because we can input things and we can start observing trends. And the best part with software is we can do these things like what if analysis. Or what if we moved our start date four weeks in advance? Does that help us with that? So, but before we can get to any of this, we really have to have all those things down, that project charter, those benchmarks where our budget cycling comes in, if we have any constraints on budget during the year. I work with some insurance companies and did some work a couple years ago, and one of the issues that they had was budget constraints. They wanted to do a lot of things, but as many of you, are, and I know some of you are, have parents who are farmers, they pay crop insurance, right? And do you pay crop insurance every month or do you pay it once a year? once a year usually. And so these insurance agencies have a lot of revenue in a short period of time and then it tapers off. So other industries like that, like a tax service. Does a tax service really get money all year long or is it a concentrated small period of time? And so they have free cash available then but not during the rest of the year. And so sometimes we need to look at that in terms of scheduling. That how is our cash flow? How are we financing this project? So that cost estimating, you may end up using your vendors to help you do that. 
And so all of those pieces fit into that budget. Because that budget includes people cost, materials cost, permits cost, whatever else is in there. And this is one of those control measures. We can also use this budget to keep control of how our budgeting is going over the year. And remember, we had some tools in there, some variance, some cost variance, and some time variance tools. So those can help you budget your both time and money as you go through there. One of the big things, and this is that idea of quality. And quality has to have that technical pieces in there also. So we have to be able to say, hey, this project is not on quality because it didn't meet this standard. Something we have in there. We all say, well, I, we, can, we can see quality when we get it, but we all have different ideas of quality. So think about a watch. Has anybody in here got a $10,000 watch? No, because that piece of quality probably isn't important to you. On the other hand, how many of you have a $10 watch? Oh, nobody's got a $10 watch. But I know that we have Apple watches in there. People have them. And they're several hundred dollars. So somebody who says, I'm only going to spend $10 for a watch at Walmart, doesn't understand what that Apple watch is, right? So different levels of expectations. We can also have different levels of quality that we expect or we look at. So we need those technical pieces. And one of them that gets, that's really, really critical is make sure you have time in, in, in your schedule and in your budget money for quality control. It's one of those that's easy to kind of try to cut out and squeeze because we think, man, I know we're going to do a quality job. We don't need these, this inspection time. We don't need those. Make sure that those are in there and they're blocked out. Because if you don't, they do tend to get peeled out. It's much like at the end of the project, one of the other ones that'll get peeled out is that idea of training. So we build a piece of software or we do something, and then at the end, we're out of money and out of time, and we go, well, we don't need to train people how to use it. So one of the other pieces of quality is how do we have a reporting mechanism? What happens? How do we report that we have a quality issue, and how does it get resolved? So if we're building a highway and there is a quality issue, the concrete starts cracking, there needs to be a procedure and a, a way to address that so it goes up into the project manager and the project manager then will then look at what are my options and how can I deal with that. So one of these is this key idea here, separate line in the budget for both quality control and assurance. So it's built in, it's specified in there, that budgeting that we actually do that. We need a place where all that quality control documents, standards, everything is located. Most likely now we're talking an online repository, but somewhere that we can all reference it and so we can all come to the same conclusions that yes, this was a, a quality project, no, it was not, and we need to address it. Having those well-defined standards can make it a lot easier when you have a contractor or somebody who is not working or playing with you and is trying to push the envelope on that. So risk and opportunities. So these kind of go hand in hand. The idea that risk can also lead to opportunities. In a lot of cases, they do. But we also need that chain of risk. In other words, you're out there on a project and you notice that maybe we'll use our road construction because we've all seen in Dodge Thick Orange Cones. And you notice that there's cracks developing in that concrete. How do you address that? Who do you go to? And so that there is a, a way that that gets managed. We do generally have specific people or a team that works with management. But the reality is it needs to be a team effort. Everybody is responsible for quality. And so that, that does need to get kind of worked in at the very beginning. And again, that idea that we generally use something called a contingency fund for risks. So we see that a lot. Anybody here watch that Chip and Gaines remodeling show? Ah, a couple of you. Have you ever noticed they always come up with, hey, there's an extra $5,000 in the budget and you can pick option A, B, or C, right? 
That's that idea of that contingency. They've built in an extra $5,000 or $10,000 or 10% or whatever it is. And they said, oh, okay, but now everything's all done. You had this extra money we set aside, and now you get to spend it. It's that idea of that contingency fund. So a pretty good rough estimate for most projects is we tend to tuck 10% back away for the idea of some kind of a risk or something happening. Now, if it's a very risky project, we may book more back. And I have seen some interesting projects where there is a high risk of failure, and they have booked 50% of the original budget as a contingency fund. So these are all kinds of tools. And we looked at that Gantt chart. So having that everybody together on one chart looking at a project is really a great way to do it. And so a lot of projects print that up nearly on a weekly basis and say, here's where we're at. Here's the activities. It's part of that executive summary. In other words, we send up to the sponsors or other stakeholders that are, that are part of it. And it's where we can revise activities if they need to. So this is one of the biggest takeaways from this entire class. And I will say this is one I struggle with is documentation. So do as I say, not as I do. But one of the things you can do throughout this project, if you have reports or other things that are generated, is we now we have some really great software. You could put it out on wikis or other software. Is you can create something like a template. So it's always the same. Every time we do a report, it's the same. And we can look at it. Executive summaries. Keeping those executives, especially your sponsor, in the loop is very, very critical. It's very critical. Managing those documents. Project logs. Most project managers run around and they have one of these weird log books in their pocket or with them. And they write down everything. Because you think, hey, I'm going to remember this. But now I need to look back a week and you go, oh, I don't remember. What day was that I talked to XYZ? And so they get in a really good habit of writing everything down about a project. And at the end of the project, that becomes part of this pile of stuff that gets archived off. Things like phone numbers, contacts. When did I contact somebody? And if a project really, really, really goes south, in other words, it fails badly, and things like lawsuits happen, those things like even keeping those logs are great. Because if you don't remember, you're going to look like an idiot when you're being disposed by a set of lawyers. And they go, well, did you talk to the contractor about the rain issue on the 13th or the 14th? And when you sit there and stammer, go, uh, 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 the 14th maybe? Those kinds of things are really good. And it's not a bad idea. Some of you probably do diaries already or journals every day. It's just kind of a continuation of that, but this is generally project specific and you start writing down everything that happens in that project so we I encourage you guys to do those kinds of things especially when you're first starting out to get in that habit of doing that so we do have a lot of different software packages and things we can use but I just found this and I thought that was really great to kind of give you a little bit of an overview about where we're headed in this and where we've been and so it kind of defines a few pieces of those project managers so go in and take a look at that. So really quickly this week, let me get this out of the way. And let me log back in because, of course, my password has expired. So this week, there are a couple of assignments that we need to make sure you've done. And so one of them, eh discussion board. So there are actually a set of discussion boards. So there is a test substitution. So make sure you have done that one. And there is a week four discussion board about motivating team members. And so I want to find out how have you motivated teams? How have you done that? Most of you have been in some kind of a project, whether you, whether you say it's a project or not. So you've had to write a team paper. You've had to do something in terms of a team membership. 
move this over. So project resource management. So we looked at quality and we found some tools in there. You probably from operations management, there's more tools. They vary so much from what project to project you're doing. If I'm writing a software piece of code, maybe part of that is ensuring that my coders write 100 lines of code a day. And so I will have some metrics for that. If I'm doing other tasks, I have some metric for it. But we get to this, and the world gets a little soft and gooey. Because people are giant pains in the butt. If you've had to work in a team, has anybody worked in a team in here? Yeah. Some of you are on athletic teams, you know, my, my two best looking members of the basketball team. And do you ever have those issues where somebody on the team is just not doing what you would like them to do? No? That's never happened? You guys always get along, everything always works smoothly. No. Unfortunately, this is an area where we struggle. Teams are great. We can make teams that do a lot of amazing things. Anybody in here got a Mac? And I know, well, anybody have a Mac with a charger? Oh, oh, sorry. You have such broad shoulders, I have to pick on you a little bit. But so the Macintosh OS X, how many people do you think it took to develop that operating system for the Mac? Hmm. How many do you think? A lot. So it's a team. We know that they're put together. Is anybody Googling that really quickly of how many people were on that? So one of the interesting things about Apple and their management is they have decided that groups or teams bigger than 100 people don't work. Can you imagine 100 people shoved into one team together? That's a, it seems like a lot of people, but it's a small number when you think about bringing out something like an operating system. So they deliberately keep their teams less than that size. There's other people that are going to say, you know, a team of more than eight people is ineffective. You spend more time working with other issues than you actually get accomplished. But teams are interesting. Teams are really interesting. And one of the things that happens is team members tend to be comprised of various groups. So on a team or a committee here on campus, we may have faculty members, we may have staff, we may have vice presidents or presidents, and ideally, in that team environment, you're all equal. But is that really the case? If you get put on a team at work and the vice president is in there, who do you think is going to do the work when they say, hey, somebody take notes today? Do you think it's going to be the vice president? No. And so as graduating students, when you get on these teams, where are you at the bottom of the barrel? You're kind of right on the bottom usually. So you need to work some political strategies. And so hopefully we can talk about enough of those to give you some, ad some advantages here. So a lot of times we talk about teams. So this particular chunk of data, we talk about resource planning, developing the team. And we spend a lot of time on that team idea because the reality is that's one of the harder skills to work on, working in teams. And I should have, in this class, made you guys all do a team project, but I have not yet. In these virtual classes, I have tried where we've had the blended classes, and they went spectacularly south. But one of the realities are there are companies now that are nearly virtual companies. Their people are spread around the country, and, it, and that happens. So learning these techniques and these abilities will hopefully benefit you out. So. Let's start looking at some of this. If I can get back to my bookmark piece, which probably I can't. So a couple of trends that are emerging. So I want to look at a couple of these. So resource management. We know that people are scarce. Right now, it's hard to hire somebody because our unemployment rate is really, really low. It is hard to go out and find somebody. If you need a specialized person, it's even worse. If you need a whopper flopper, you can find whopper floppers. But people that can go out and do specialized items are pretty hard to get. And in fact, if you look at the trends in terms of degrees and certificates and unemployment rates, you can see that. So if I just have a high school diploma, 
I have a much higher unemployment rate than if I have a college degree or a master's degree. So we have to come up with some kind of resource management. And so you'll see some terms in here you may have seen other places. So we know that resources also include parts and inventory and things are expensive. So just in time, you may have seen the term Kaizen, where we take away resources each cycle and try to see if, if our teams can continue to develop the product. So you see quality circles, productivity management. You see all these different things. Continuous product improvement all kind of land up in here in this idea. So we have some new techniques or new work techniques that really came out of manufacturing, and now we're applying them not just to parts and things, but to people. And we're also working those same ideas. We know that people are a scarce resource. We also, we also have developed this idea of intelligence. And not just, not just like a cognitive intelligence, but what we call emotional intelligence, or an EQ, sometimes you'll see it. And there are companies that specialize in testing software to try to tell you the emotional intelligence of your employees. Some companies run you through an entire psychological exam before they hire you. Has anybody applied at Gallup Corporation? No, none of you? It's an interesting process, and you should look at it, because the, the, uh, when you go to apply, it's not just a, here's where I am. You go through an entire EQ test, your, your emotional intelligence, your emotional quotient, because what they want to do is be able to match people in teams by characteristics that they have. And so you're seeing a lot more companies doing this, that idea of emotional testing. So it's not just, hey, I've got a 4.0, and I graduated from a really great school. Now we also have a lot of, of testing. One of the other things that you're seeing a lot is this idea of virtual teams, or they, the term distributed. Because we don't have people all together in one area. It's very expensive to move people to one area. So a lot of software, a lot of things get developed in virtual teams. So in other words, you're sitting in Orlando. Somebody else is sitting in Tampa. Maybe somebody else is halfway around the world in Australia. How do I deal with that? So virtual teams have some advantages, but there's a disadvantage. There is a real great advantage to looking at somebody in the eye, being able to, to see what they're doing, and so even though we now have video chat and other things, it's not the same as being physically next to somebody. So one of the tools that we usually do in, the, in a virtual team is we, we will say, you know, we work 90% of the time, maybe we're all virtual, but your kickoff meeting, so at the beginning of the project, you'll probably fly everybody in, and then at the end, like a wrap up or, or maybe halfway. So you'll have like a couple of milestone meetings where you do try to get everybody physically together. And so that's one of, the, one of the ways we can do that. But it's also very hard as a project manager. Imagine if you're a project manager, you have a team that's around the world, and you're getting emails anywhere from 3 in the morning until 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And you're trying to deal with that. People are on different time zones. So setting up some of those ground rules about how that team is going to work and how your team is managed is very, very important. So you need to plan that resource management. So all of these come in. We have that charter comes in. And again, that says, here's what we're going to do. We have a management plan. How are we going to manage the expectations we set in that charter? And then we start coming out with that scheduling and other documents that come into play. So we need to create a plan to manage all these people that we're going to have. So we're going to include that quality management plan. There's a lot of things that are going to affect all this, though. Do we have existing resources? So if I need a CPA for my project, do we have those available? Where do they come from? Where are they located at? But what about our company? Does it have a culture and a structure that may change things? So very rigid, structured companies. So traditional companies you think of like IBM find it very hard to do these kinds of virtual projects, or used to. There are other companies that at one point said, you know what, we're going to do this. We like these ideas, and we're going to let employees work from home all the time. And then suddenly we get a new CEO, and that goes away. So you have to be cognizant of what's going on in that culture. 
And if there's going to be a shift, how can we how can we look at that? So human resources, what kind of policies do we have? So can we work employees? And so if we're a multinational corporation, we may have even different employee policies for different countries. So what's if I'm in Europe, do they typically work 40 hours a week? Hmm. Hmm. Do they typically only get two weeks a year of vacation? No. They get a lot compared to us. Because they have realized that you know, our employees, if they're well rested, maybe are more productive in the time we do work them. So a lot of countries, 32 hours is full time. Versus the United States, a lot of companies, when you graduate and you want to go to work for a company, there are companies that will say, hey, come to work for us, but we're going to work your tail off, and you're going to work 60, 70, 80, 90, or more hours a week. So we've had employees that have ran into that. They've left, or, or graduates, and that was different than their expectation. They were expected to work you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, and it became very much company first. So make sure you are aware of what kind of policies, what kind of security pieces are in place. And that's an increasingly prevalent issue we're having is that idea of security. How do, I, how do I manage the safety of my employees, whether they're on my team or whether they're on my... So one of the things that we have, and we emphasize, and you've probably heard it called soft skills, that ability to negotiate and use your persuasion to get things, you've probably ran into people like, that are very good at that. And you also have ran into people who can't negotiate at all. And because most cases, you're not getting the ability to say, all right, I'm stealing Ruth for three weeks from your department. You're going to have to negotiate, how do I get employees out? And you're probably not going to get always the best or, or uh, the, the greatest person out there. So how do I put those together? So when we're organizing those teams, one of those things that's really a great idea is something like this RAM chart, or responsibility matrix. Think about the last paper you guys all wrote together or project in class. Would this have been a good idea to write this up this way so that we knew exactly who was in charge of each particular item, who had responsibility, who was maybe informing or consulting? So those kinds of tools are critical for that team success. And are there times we do get rid of people out of a team? Yup. And do we have meetings? Unfortunately. But those meetings are really a great way that we can do that. So how do I start grabbing those resources? So our book says here we're going to create a resource plan. And so how do we acquire those resources becomes important. So that project charter and our documentation will give us that authority based on our sponsor, in some cases, to go out and get those resources. Because as a project manager, we're really, we really have no direct responsibility. We're more of a coordinator, if you want to think about it that way. So we need some way that we can get authority to go out and get make decisions. And that comes out of this documentation, and generally it trickles down out of our sponsor. So there have been cases where projects have went badly wrong. A sponsor gets demoted or loses favor. So how we can do that? So one of the things that's very important is these ideas of these, these organizational charts. So we have them here at Peru, and it shows who is in charge of what activities on our campus and that lines of authority. And so we do the same thing in project management. We do a, a lot of times we make a smaller document. It's not the size of your project document, but it's specific to these teams. It's a, like a team charter, or if you're on a group on campus, it's that constitution that you would have, the same type of idea. So what are you doing? How am I going to communicate? What do we do for conflict resolution? And from some of your classes, are we always going to be conflict-free, or are we going to have conflict? 
we're always going to have conflict. So we need some strategies to address it. We can actually use conflict to be a very useful tool. Now when I say conflict, hopefully we're not talking about people standing up and punching each other, but we are going to have that idea of conflict at some point. And so this team charter then gives us that idea of what we can do, kind of a code of conduct, what we can actually, what we can, what we can require. And so teams are ugly. There's no way around it. But the more you're in teams, the more you can start to work with that group. And suddenly teams start looking like a beautiful resource. It lets that work become distributed. It lets you share resources. And we can start to work together towards a common goal. Well, our team is going to need something. And our team is going to need resources of some kind. So what we can do is we can actually create a resource management plan. So hopefully we've already created that throughout the project. We can now break it down for a individual team because we're it's generally multiple teams working on a project. And so we can break those resource allocation logs down. We can break those cost estimates down. And so it gives us a way that we can look at the world in a smaller and smaller chunk. We've got a big project. We're taking smaller bites of it. A small team, 8, 10, 12 people, whatever it is in there, they're taking smaller bites of it. And it becomes more achievable. So we're going to develop a new operating system like Mac OS X. We're going to break it down into small enough chunks that people can, can work on it and we can get that accomplished. But if we don't have that overall scope and that overall charter done, it's hard to break it up into assignable tasks if we don't have that. So one of the best things is that idea of resource calendars. Because we're all fighting over shared resources, some way to assign those resources and coordinate those resources becomes important. Your project, depending on the size of it, may have somebody that that is the only thing that they do is schedule resources. Because we may have to outsource resources, bring them in, and you may have somebody that that's all they do. They work on, on how do I schedule all these human resources out. Where my wife works at UNL, one of their tasks is they train health and human service workers. And they actually have a person. That is their entire job is to schedule those groups of trainers and materials and resources and incoming classes through health and human services and so they're trying to match those up and find all the resources. So that way they can use, they have what they call a simulation house. So that it is used to its fullest capacity. That the trainers are all worked at the appropriate level, not overworked, not underworked. And that any of those outside resources, they do a lot of training with things like law enforcement. So they have to contact them. When are they available? And how do we shuffle and juggle this around to make it work so that these employees get the proper training? And so. Don't be surprised on a larger project. That's somebody you have in there. And that's kind of that right-hand person to that project manager, quite frankly. They're, they're one of the most important keys in there is being able to. Now, in a lot of cases, smaller projects, that becomes that project manager responsibility to try to schedule all those resources. Well, we have a lot of tools. One of the things that has hopefully happened when you created those work breakdown structures, you looked at what kind of items are needed in there. So we have people, we have time, we have materials that are needed, we have other resources. And so that's a way we can break those projects down into smaller and smaller pieces. So again, if we're working on our highway project out here, we may break down a work down structure to building the sidewalks in Peru. And we know what equipment we need, we know how long it's going to take, and we've created that, that breakdown. So our estimates are really the same as what we've done before. Now we're doing it just slightly smaller pieces. So here we have that, that chart there we'll show you. We have both people 
We have materials, we may have equipment, and we all have to schedule all of those so they work together. So a good one to think about in there, all of you have flown on an airplane, I suspect. Has anybody not flown on an airplane? You have not flown on an airplane. Oh. Well, imagine this scenario of an airplane. Can I just put anybody on my team in as a pilot? No, they have to have, so I've got specialized resources. Do I have specialized equipment to maintain the aircraft? No. And I have special materials. So that food they put on the airplane, and I say food kind of in a laughing manner, all of that, how do we figure that out? And so by building that all together, we have to schedule all of those items together to get it to work. One of the most important things we have, again, is that documentation, that idea of what we learned on the last project or what we're learning on this project. Because we're always going to be learning. There is never going to be a time when you're going to say, you know what, nothing went wrong on a project. And if you have employees that say, I have never messed up in my life, then they are lying to you right there. But if you learn from your errors or your mistakes, it can be a really, really great tool to learn from what you've done wrong. And we're all going to make mistakes. And part of that idea of a project manager is how do you get your employees to realize that and learn from those mistakes and move on and move forward. And so you're going to run into that as an issue quite a bit. And then we have this idea of acquiring resources. And this really is probably, I think, one of the harder things in here because, again, you don't have necessarily line authority to go out and just order backhoes or construction equipment. So you have to come up with a way that you can, you can get those resources. And you may have to use some of your knowledge so that you can juggle some of those tasks around. So that, you know what, we needed a backhoe four weeks of this entire job. And instead of scheduling it a week here at the beginning, a week at the end, we schedule everything together. I work with other departments so that I can borrow employees on their slow time. Maybe I don't take the CPA when it's tax time for the company. So those kinds of things. So. I have to make sure that all of those factors come into play. I need to make sure that I get the employees with the right skills. And I need to assign them to the right areas. Again, if I'm trying to fly a plane and I assign the mechanic to the, co to the pilot seat, sure, maybe he can get the plane off the ground, but is it going to be a great experience for the, for the customers? Even worse, what if I assigned the pilot to work on the plane? How would that be? probably would not go very well. And so we need to realize that everything has a place and everybody has a skill set in this group, but we need to make sure they're assigned in the correct, correct area. So one of the other things that happens, and we've talked a little bit about it, and I keep harping about this idea of change requests. So we really need a formal process in our team and in our entire project for that idea of a change request. Some way that that paperwork is created, a log is created of every change. So anything that needs to be changed, we have a process. We don't want it to not change, but by the same token, we also need to control those changes very, very carefully. So some of you have experienced changes in things as you've worked on them. Maybe your project was to go buy a car. If you went car shopping and you initially said, man, I really, I'm going to spend $10,000 on a car, and you went in and talked to the salesman at a car dealership, did they want to make you change your mind on how much you were going to spend? Yeah. And so we have to have some way we can handle those changes, and that way you don't end up leaving the lot in a you know, Corvette. Because while they're fun, is that really practical for a college student? Except for Justin. Justin needs a Corvette. I can see a ticket in the first day. and So we need to have a way that we can change those. Everything needs to be documented. So 
Things like that lessons learned register, that risk, risk register. Who are the stakeholders? And we may find that stakeholders emerge at certain parts of a project. So high visibility items, suddenly they're flying out of the woodwork. And sometimes stakeholders have agendas of their own. So if we have politicians, for example, as stakeholders. So we're a state college and some of our stakeholders, when we rebuilt the football stadium, we had political people as stakeholders. And they will emerge at certain times and it very much is an ego stroking for them and we need to make sure we deal with it and how we deal with it. So resource management, not just people, not just places, but that entire thing is kind of a, a skill that you're going to gain. And it's one of those things we tend to say it's a soft skill, that ability to manage people. And most of you have had human behavior and you've known about like theory X, theory Y, or McGregor's theory and some of these other other things we're going to look at. But that ability to use that knowledge becomes really, really critical. How do I manage teams? And I have had people who have had no college experience working for me, and they had the best ability to manage a team. And then I had people who I thought they had a college degree, in some cases came out of the armed forces, as, as, in some cases as an officer, and I thought, these guys are going to manage teams for me great. And the only way they knew how to manage a team was yell at people. That didn't exactly work very well. Is there a time where yelling is necessary sometimes? Yeah. Is there also a time when, when working with people and doing small things to show that you're part of that team become very, very valuable? It, it, it is. And so make sure you read about teams in here. You're going to take knowledge out of your own skill set about teams and how you get these people loyal to you as that project manager. You can't always offer them directly anything. And in fact, we know, is, is money really a great motivator for most people? <laughs> Aside from <laughs> money does motivate people, but are there other things that motivate people far more? There, there is, and we, found, and we find that out repeatedly. When we study people, we go, Oh, you know what? Now, as a college student, your brain is probably a little wired to think, I just want to make any kind of money so I can have some. I just, I just would like to touch it and see it. But we know that things that can build team loyalty that you wouldn't ever imagine aside from that. I actually have a couple of people that I'm still in contact with. I see them on Facebook all the time. They message me, and I visit with them. When we used to do, when I used to work in, in putting a fiber up cable in the ground, and I came up onto a job site many, many years ago, down actually by Justin Poole's hometown. Just thought I'd throw that out there for you. And they were digging. It's about to rain. They're trying to get some stuff done. And I'm down there just talking with them. And I jump in the hole with a shovel. And I don't like to shovel, but you know, I'm like, you know, hey, I'm here. We're talking. Let's, let's get this knocked out really quickly. And just that simple act, those guys, when I went on jobs, would say, hey, you know what, uh, can we get on, on Brad's job versus this one? Just those little things like that in your teams, showing them that you're going to be willing to work, putting in the same amount of effort, showing them that they're, you're willing to do those things, makes a tremendous difference. And, it's, and it really is an oddity when you do that. So could I have just yelled at him to get their job done? Yeah. But I had some managers for me that did that. And you know what? When push him to shove, I had one guy who worked for me. He'd repeatedly get his truck stuck in the mud because he didn't know how to drive. And so here's a team with a backhoe and construction equipment. Do you think they pulled him out? No. Just those simple little things by, by working with your team. So you've probably seen this model here of how a team gets stuck and how they approach it. So this forming, storming, norming group. So make sure you read this. If you have not seen this, in another book, this is another model of it. You'll see this in Org Behavior, I'm pretty sure, where we talk about teams. I'm sure it pops up in some of our other books. And again, that idea of that geographic and other environmental factors. We can't control them. A lot of times we are given restrictions by our area, and how do we get around those? So there are things we have to do. So. Tools and techniques. 
virtual teams. The most transparent tools you can use. So things like video conferencing, where you can actually see somebody instead of the hideousness of a conference call. If you have had to ever do weekly conference calls where all you are is on a phone line, does anybody actually pay attention to it? No. They're over searching Facebook, they're doing other things. But that virtual Teams, where that camera is on you, makes a big difference in getting your attention into that group. Limiting things like those team meetings to a certain length. So one of them we used to use when I worked on some projects was, we said, you know what, at the very beginning, we will not have a meeting longer than 38 minutes. And so we would organize those activities to try to be less than 38 minutes. Was 38 minutes a magic number? No, it really came out of watching kids in class. And we, we could see that, you know what, at about that 30 minute, 35 minute mark, people get antsy. You get tired of sitting there. These chairs aren't comfortable, the same as when you're in that group. So some tools that you can use, things like that. So, you may do this idea of co-location where we shuffle people around, but I will tell you there's a problem with that, and, and actually a couple. Do people like to get moved for the most part? No. Now, if you're moving across Kansas City from the north to the south for a couple of weeks, that's probably different. But those employees who are moved on a continual basis are generally not very happy. There's a few. If you're single and you like to travel, it may be great. For those people with families, it tends to be be an issue. So down here there's a couple of different things. Audio conferencing, horrible. There are alternatives. Email, I'm going to say, is actually fairly horrible. Does anybody like email now? No. There are alternatives to email that work very well. And so one of them I like is a project called Slack, and there's some very similar ones, where it's essentially a chat feature on your computer or your phone or your device. We're all used to chatting, right? The advantage, though, is we can actually move documents, and it keeps that chat forever. It keeps a log of it. So if I tell JC that she's going to be the one digging the hole, you're going to be shoveling out that hole, it's in that chat feature, and we can actually document it and use forms inside of there. Email is not as effective as it used to be. Even here on campus, if I send out an email out of Blackboard, it may be days before somebody sees it. So every time something happens and we have to reschedule a class, I go, well, all right, this isn't going to work very well because nobody's going to read that email. And I always dread if I get sick like I did this week, unfortunately. If I just send an email, most people end up showing up at the door anyway because they didn't check their email in the morning. We're just not used to doing that anymore. Email is mostly spam at this point, and it's, and it's losing its effectiveness. Other things that we might want to include in there. So generally, we need some form of conflict management. So one of the great tools that happens or can happen is a lot of companies have people that can talk about conflict management. And so your entire team, you send them to a couple hour conflict management skill set so they can pick up some of those skills. We do team building activities. Now, some of them are really great, and sometimes team building gets a little over the top. So you have to be careful. Some people resent it when you start doing that. But instead of just one team building activity at the beginning, you kind of want to put them in where you have it as a continuous process to keep people re-involved, reinvigorated. Figuring out your motivation, and your discussion board is actually about motivation this week. How do I motivate a team? Do I yell at them, or do I offer them cookies and candy? There are different ways we can do those kinds of things. So team building, people like rewards. So that idea of giving out rewards for things, people are very motivated. So one of the companies that really has figured this out is McDonald's. Is anybody working here at McDonald's currently? Has anybody worked in McDonald's? Oh. So McDonald's has figured out that even things like titles, people like the idea that they are now a, a have a swing shift leader or whatever title they get. People like that idea. People like being called team members instead of just, you know, your employee number 37. And so that idea of how to re reward teams and people is really, really good. Giving people additional opportunities, challenges, people like that. Money does play into it. Some people are very money motivated. 
but the reality is you usually get far more out of things other than money. At some point when you can pay all your bills every month, money's not quite as exciting to you. It is to me, because I'm still not there yet. But someplace, people get very, very motivated by the idea that we can do new challenges. And so once you reach some stability in your career, that gives you a place where you can go. So you may do team training. You may do all different kinds of things. You need to keep your team updated. So if there are changes on the project, if there's other things happening, that you can do that. So part of that idea is that managing that team How do I do that, managing my team? So what kind of tools do I have? Is my team ever going to have a problem? How do I handle when we have conflict? So again, setting up some structures. Some places have, and some corporations will even have a conflict resolution center where you can go and you can address if you have a conflict in there. And when I say conflict, again, we're not talking usually about people swinging at each other, although I have actually seen that. And not in a construction site, in the academic environment, I have actually seen a fist fight before, which I thought was truly not right. So conflict management, really, really important. And so make sure you looked at those five different ways that you can get out of conflict or work with conflict. So oftentimes we think the only way is to... A, to avoid, but we have some other methods that we can do. And in a lot of cases, we can turn that conflict into a win-win situation. And that's what we'd like to arguably try to get to, is where we, where we win. So that idea of emotional intelligence, sometimes we can pick our team members. And that idea of influence. People who are able to influence others and we've all ran into them. When you were on the playground, there was always that one kid that was able to talk you into doing something bad. That ability to influence is really pretty interesting. And some people have really have it. And so we're, we've studied that. We've come up with these emotional contexts that say, if you have traits A, B, and C, you're really probably good at that. We know that we can learn leadership and influence skills. So take advantage of those. Take the leadership skill courses that, when you find them. And look at them. Try to become a strong leader. So manage the people. So one of the things I always like to think about if I'm managing people is I like to put myself in this. If, if I were on this team, what would I like that project manager or that leader of that committee to do? And Unfortunately, it can't always be like rainbows and sprinkles and cupcakes and unicorns, but what would I like to do to be able to solve that problem? And so the more of those kinds of tasks you can do and you can get people to do, the better off you are. So the other piece of that then is monitoring and controlling those resources. So making sure that my team members aren't going over time or over budget on a project and looking at it on a fairly regular basis, keeping track of things that we have issues with. Maybe our team is behind, and that issues log or a trouble log can tell us why. And maybe it's we can't get parts from a vendor. Maybe it's not really a project with issue with my schedule. Maybe I have a very tall, small team, and Mike continually is sick. Maybe we need to look at what's, what's going on in those teams, and can we bring somebody temporarily to replace Mike, if that's the case. And then we need to look at that analysis. So we can look at a lot of different ways, variance analysis, trend analysis, historical analysis. We can plot graphs. We can do charts. In general, you will have some way that you are monitoring your expenditures of time, your outputs, so that your outputs match the inputs. In other words, we're where we think we should be on this product cycle, whether we're building a project, whether we're building a software piece, or whether we're just managing people in general. We need some way to do it. And then if there's a problem, there's a lot of different tools in there that we can use. So first is identifying it, and then we need to figure out the root cause. And so things like that Ishikawa diagram, that, that skeleton chart, you've probably seen the fishbone chart. The way we can identify what the root cause of an issue is becomes really important. So 
That idea of soft skills, again, negotiation, influencing, really important in teams. The better at those you are, the better in a team you're going to be and the better leader you're going to be inside of that team. All right, so next week, this week you get a little break on a quiz. Yes, next week there will be one. So on Sunday, what is due is your project charter. You have two discussion boards due. Next week, we're going to start on communications. And so we're going to look at how do we communicate in groups, how do we communicate on teams. And so we're going to do a real quick overview. Most of you have had already, unless you're one of the weird ones that waits till the last minute, you've had business communications. So we're going to do a recap of a few ideas that are in there and maybe update with some latest trends, latest technologies, latest things that are happening. And one of the things I'd like to show you next week is Slack. So be prepared. Bring your computer in if you want to use it for that, or you're welcome to use the lab computers, and we can look at that. Online, we'll probably try to set up a Slack group also. And we can see then how some new technologies and trends in communication are going. All right, any questions? All right, if you have questions about the project, about the project charter assignment, email over the weekend. I will be in Minneapolis Moline this weekend, so I don't know how good my Wi-Fi is. So email early, not at 10 o'clock on Sunday night. It'll probably go to my phone, and I can probably get it, but I, am, I may have a little bit of an issue. I do not know. All right, let me stop the recording, and then I'll grab your question here.